All right, we're in the last uh, uh, part of this series in the book of Galatians. Uh, has any one of you enjoyed this uh, particular series? All right, I don't know about you, but uh, I've enjoyed it. I've, I've enjoyed preaching it. I've enjoyed uh, uh, studying this book, and um, I believe uh, all of us uh, are better for studying it. All of us have a better understanding of the gospel, and I pray that uh, all of us will live uh, a lives that are centered around the gospel in our everyday lives. Amen? And so we're uh, today in the final week of this particular series. We'll start a new series next week. And uh, uh, so as we're wrapping things up, we're in the last chapter of the book of Galatians. And so uh, Paul is wrapping things up with all of the things that he has talked about in the last five chapters. Uh, uh, he's wrapping things up here. And what I want to do in chapter six is I'll, I'll first read the entire chapter. And once I read the entire chapter, I want to uh, look at two specific things that he talks about. And we'll spend the rest of uh, uh, the time talking about those two things, all right? So if you have your Bibles, open them up, uh, Galatians chapter 6, and, and we'll start reading, and you can follow uh, on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you this morning. Dear brothers and sisters, in a, uh, if another believer is overcome by sin and you are godly, should gently, uh, those who are godly, um, should gently and humbly help the person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Uh, let me just make a point. He does not say obey the law of Moses. He's not talking about the Old Covenant or Old Testament law. He's saying to obey the law of Christ, which is love uh, uh, God and love your neighbor as yourself. So walking in the commandment of love is what he's talking about. And so that's why he's talking about caring for one another and helping one another. And then he goes on to say, verse 3, If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. All right? Verse 4, Pay careful attention to your work, to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each other's, uh, sorry, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Verse 6, those who are taught in the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You, always, you will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Verse 11, notice that what, uh, what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want, to, want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. Verse 14, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in the world has been crucified and the world's interest in me also has died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live in this principle, all who live by this principle, they are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, you can see that 
as he's coming to the close, he's greeting all the people or he's talking about all the uh, uh, things that they need to be doing and the way they need to live a godly lifestyle. And then towards the end, he again talks about circumcision just to make sure everyone still understands the point of their faith in Christ and in the work of the cross. And then at the end, he says in verse 17, I like how he closes it. He says, from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things anymore. It's like I've had enough. This letter should settle all your doubts, all your uh, questions, all your fightings and ramblings about what is taking place. Don't bother me with this anymore. This is my final, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, judgment or this is my final verdict on all of these things that have been going on in the church. All right. So there's a lot that we can talk about. But for sake of time, I picked two different things that I really want us to focus in on. So let's jump to verse six. Uh, Galatians 6 6 it says those who are taught in the word of God should provide for their teachers sharing all good things with them and then he goes on to say don't be misled you cannot mock the justice of God you will always harvest what you plant all right now what he's talking about in verse 6 is he's saying those uh, uh, the people that are in the ministry those who are actually teaching the word of God to you Paul says they are ministering unto you spiritual things. So as they're ministering unto you spiritual things, you out of your natural resources need to be taking care of them or you need to be giving to them. All right. And then he goes on to say in verse seven, he could, there's a connection between verse six and verse seven and verse seven. Then he goes on to say, don't mock the justice of God. Don't be misled. He says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For a few minutes, I just want to talk to you about this law of sowing and reaping. Okay, the law of sowing and reaping. Now, men, if you've been raised in the church or if you've go been going to the church, you've probably heard that phrase. You've probably heard that term before. And some of you, depending on your background, depending on where you come from, you will have different uh, uh, responses even when you hear that term or that phrase sowing and reaping. The reason for that is because there has been a, a misinterpretation and there has been an abuse of that term in the body of Christ. And so there, there uh, and so in certain cases it has got take, it, it has been preached in, in extreme measures where people begin to just give or sow just with the intent so that they can quickly and selfishly in that point of time get something from God and, and, and that's where things have been misled. But just because things have been misrepresented does not mean we throw the baby with the bath water. All right. Just because there has been a misrepresentation, we don't say, OK, we need to stop talking about that. And that's not true at all. No, there is truth to it. The Bible talks about it. We just need to make sure that we are in line with Scripture and that we're understanding the way the Bible talks about it. Amen. So even in, in see one of the uh, one of the best ways to judge whether some, we need to believe something or whether we need to begin to practice something in our lives is quickly look at the life of Jesus and what he had to say about that. So Luke chapter six, please, if you can turn your Bibles there, Luke chapter six and verse thirty eight. Luke 6, 38. And again, a well-known scripture to many of you. Uh, uh, if you guys can have that on the screen. Luke 6, 38. And it says, give and you will receive. Again, in other words, you can say, sow and you will harvest. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Uh, Press down, shaken together to make room for more running over and poured into your lap, the amount you will uh, uh, you give will determine the amount you will get back. All right. Now, how many of you have listened to this verse or read this verse before? All right. Pretty much all of you. Yeah? How many of you actually ever understood what it meant by press down, shaken together, running over? Right. We all know the part where it says give and it shall be given unto you. And it goes on to say in King James, it will say, good down, uh, press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom with the same measure that you give, it shall be measured back to you. What the heck is press down, shaken together, running over? Well, you see, he's talking about 
uh, uh, to people from an agricultural uh, 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 society at that point. And so what used to happen is when the harvests would come in, they would collect them in barns. And when the uh, barn, uh, sorry, well, uh, in these containers, and when those containers were filled, uh, uh, there used to be times where the owner might say, okay, one of these things, one of these containers, you can keep them for yourself. He would give it to the people that were working there. And so what they would do is, now, if there is a, a container that says, you can fill up that container and take that home with you, what are we going to do? We maximize how much goes into that container. Right? You say, if, if I say, hey, here's a shopping cart, anything you put in that shopping cart, fill it up, that's yours. What are you going to do? You're not going to put three items and say, okay, this is enough. You're going to try to adjust. It's like packing a suitcase. If any one of you have traveled with children or family or kids, what do you, you maximize, you press things, you fold things, you uh, bend things, you try to do whatever you can to maximize what can fit in that suitcase or in that container. So also with this agricultural society at that time, what they would do is they would press it down and then shake it. And what happens when you shake? It settles down. So you press down, shake it together, running over. They would fill it up, and when they would carry it, some of it would be spilling out. But they would fill it so much so that even if things are spilling out, by the time they get home, it's still full, overflowing. So what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, give and it shall be given unto you. Right? In other words, sow and you will receive a harvest. What kind of harvest will you receive? Jesus says it will be pressed down. It will be shaken together and running over. And he says with the same measure that you give, it will be measured back to you. In the, in the New Living, it says the amount you will, uh, uh, the, amount, uh, give it, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. In other words, the amount you sow will determine your harvest, right? So if you're expecting any farmer that sows, he sows in proportion to the harvest that he wants to get, right? If you have one acre of land, if you're a farmer, you don't plant on just, you know, uh, uh, um, you know a small part or, or, or you don't uh, uh, plant for a quarter of the acre and expect, I want to get a harvest of one acre. No, you're not. Whatever you plant or so will determine what you receive. Now, here's the thing. Jesus is also talking about this in financial terms, all right? He's not just talking, again, especially when you go back to Galatians chapter 6, Paul there specifically is talking about blessing or, uh, uh, you know, helping those people who are preaching the gospel. So pa the people in the fivefold ministry, all right? Now, today, I'm not asking for your gifts. I'm not asking, I'm not raising up a special offering, so don't worry about that. But I want you to know that this truth is still valid for us today, all right? Now, because we don't, see, uh, you, you'll be shocked at the number of people that have actually come and blessed me or given and say, Pastor, this is for you. Thank you for what you do. Do you know, like, uh, uh, again, please, please, please understand, I'm not saying this so that I can get something from you, okay? But in my time of pastoring here, I've had, I think, two people, two people who've come and said, Pastor, this is for you. Now, there are a lot of people that will come and, and place something in my hand and it's their tithe. And that tithe goes directly to the church. I don't take not one rupee out of anything that is placed in my hand. The only time I put it for myself is if that person comes and say, Pastor, this is not for the church. This is for you. And I've had two people come and do that so far. All right. So what, in other words, what I'm saying is there, there are things in the word of God which are still true for us today. But a lot of us, because we've never been taught, we've never been uh, uh, groomed in those things. We have never practiced that in our life as well. OK. And, and, and if we don't practice certain things that are still true for us today, what happens? We still will miss out on the things or the, the, the results of doing those things in our lives. Amen. So one of the things that we need to understand, and if you're taking notes, write this down. What you keep is all you will have. 
What you keep is all you will have. I know it sounds very profound, but write that down because sometimes, even though it's so simple, we don't really think through that. What you keep is all you have. What you give, God multiplies. What you keep is all you have. What you give, God multiplies. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 9, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's see what it says here. It's just one chapter before, uh, uh, one book before uh, the book of Galatians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and starting from verse 6. And before we read and, and, and write this statement down as well. You reap more than you sow. You will always reap more than you sow. That's just the law. That's just how things work. You will always reap more than you sow. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and starting from verse 6. Let's see this. Um, all right, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't be reluctant, uh, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver or God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide you all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share, they, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, for God is... Is the one who provides seed to the farmer and bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of your uh, of generosity in you verse 11 yes you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous and when we take your gifts to those who need them they will thank God amen now, a couple of things that I want us to uh, 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 learn from this. In verse 8, let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, And God will generously provide you all you need. Wait, uh, uh, let's go to verse 7, I'm sorry. Verse 7 says, You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now, this is important because a lot of people in the church, and, and I'm not just talking about our church, but I'm talking about church in general, they only give when there is compulsion from the pulpit. That's why you hear a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers saying, if you don't give, we need to stop this program. If you don't give, the kids will go hungry. If you don't give, we have to shut down the school. If we don't, and there's pressure, and when that pressure comes, that's when they give. It's almost like, Ugh, I had, so I guess I have to give, so I will give. And what the scripture is saying is, no, don't give based on that, but it's saying you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. That means what? That means your giving should not be a response to what is being said. Your giving has to be a decision that you've already made before you come to church. See, if you're married, your giving has to be a decision that as a husband and wife, you come together and we say, okay, God has blessed us with this. God has put this in our hands. What is it that we need to do? How do we seek first the kingdom of God with the resources that God has given to us? Now, based on that, you make a decision. So when you come to church, you've already prayed over the tithe. You've already prayed over the offering. Now you are coming and then you give. But how do most Christians uh, 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 work through this in their life? We just walk into church when the pastor starts putting pressure on money. When the pastor says you have to give so much or we have to meet our budget and we have to do this, we have to do that. Or in some cases, if you don't give, God will curse you. Or if you don't give, then you will not be blessed. You, you, you start hearing these messages and out of fear, out of compulsion, out of pressure, what do you do? You reluctantly give to God. 
There's no cheerfulness in your heart. There's no gratitude in your heart. You're not doing it out of joy, but you're reluctantly giving unto God. And the Bible says that's not what God is looking for. Right? God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Any cheerful givers this morning? Yes. Amen. So when we give, you determine in your heart, and then you come and you say, God, what is it that I need to give? God speaks to you, you determine that, and then you come to church. And when you give, you're, if you're husband and wife, you pray over the seed that you're sowing, and you sow it into the kingdom of God. Amen? And then it goes on to say in verse, verse 8, And God will generously provide all you need. Who will? God will generously provide all you need. Here's another thing that I want you to write down. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. There's never going to be a time where you will outgive God in your life, in any area. And that includes finances as well. That includes finances as well. You can never outgive God. And then he goes on to say, uh, uh, let's jump to verse uh, 10. For God is the one who provides seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and, uh, uh, and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. This is such an amazing scripture. He says, God will provide seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, you have to know in your life whether you are a person that is sowing or you're a person that is eating. The problem most Christians have problems financially is because they eat their seed. That's the problem. We have problems financially. Christians, we are not supposed to live in financial lack for the rest of our life. I'm not saying that every one of you will become millionaires tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. But I see, for those of you who say Jesus was extremely poor, I, I'm, I don't want to get into this because it'll take too much time. But I will say this. He never lacked anything. He never lacked anything. So at the least, if you, I'm not saying everyone needs to become a billionaire by next month. But at the least, I'm saying we're not supposed to lack. Now, you can, you can take a look at certain uh, uh, other examples. Well, that was a great man of God and, and he did not have money. So what? He is not your example. Who is your example? Jesus is. And I've never seen Jesus go hungry. I've never seen Jesus say, I don't have enough to continue my ministry. There was never a lack. The problem, if we are facing lag, the question we need to ask ourselves is, where do I need to make an adjustment in my life? He is the example that we're supposed to follow. And so he says, the God provides seed to the sower. That's why every single one of you, if you can, you, you can have zero balance in your bank account and still have the heart of a sower, and God will provide you the seed to sow. God will provide you the seed to sow. There was a time, uh, and I think I shared, I don't know if I shared this in the church, maybe I, I shared it with, my, my, uh, with the team and, and the servant leaders in the church. There was a time when I was attending, uh, when I was a lot younger and I was attending another church and uh, 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 there was a project that was taking place and, and they were saying, you know, to, for us to accomplish this project, uh, we need people who will give this much amount of money, another group that will give this much and another group that will give this much. And I wanted to be, my heart was to give the, the maximum amount of money that was required for that particular project. Now, that amount of money would be more than my entire years of salary combined. Entire years worth of salary combined would not reach that goal. Right? But in my heart, I wanted to do that. And so that day, I saw, so I saw the scripture and I prayed and I said, God, you provide me with the money, I'll make sure I sow it. You provide me with the money, I'll make sure I sow it. And guess what? My salary did not increase. See, some of us, we, 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 we want to do stuff when our lives get better. And God's saying, no, 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 I'll give seed to the sower. I'll give food to the eater or bread to the eater. 
See, a lot of us, God places certain things in our hands, and the first thing we do is run to the shopping mall, go to and, and get something, get a bigger car, make our payments even greater than, than they already are, and what do we happen? And then when there's a need in the kingdom of God, then when there's an opportunity to be a blessing, we're not able to. Why? Because you're already blessing all the five different bank accounts that you have and the five different credit cards that you've maxed out. So the ministry of Access Bank, the ministry of whatever bank that you have, you're giving to all of these ministries and you don't have any money left to give to the church or another uh, a family member or the neighbor down the street or, or someone else that is in need. And, and God's directing you, you know, man, if I had the money. Well, the reason you don't have the money is because your car has the money or someone else has the money. And God is saying, I will give seed to the sower. I will give bread to the eater. If we're careful and if we understand every single month when you get your money, if you say, God, what is the seed in this? So at the minimum, at the minimum, you got, if you call yourself a Christian, if you're coming and if you want to see God move even in your finances, at the minimum, 10% is the tithe that is established in the Old, Old Covenant, Old Testament. Again, I know if we want to get really technical, the tithe is way more than 10%, actually, in the Old Testament. Okay, but I'm not even getting technical. I'm just talking about a person that is generous in their giving. A person with a generous heart. Amen. So one of the reasons, man, I'm, I'm running out of time. Look, very quickly, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 4. See, one of the reasons why people are afraid to give or, 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 or uh, uh, and trust God in their finances. Here, Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. You know why certain Christians are, are afraid to give their money? Because they're looking for the perfect scenario. And they're saying, when all my payments are made, when all my kids are done with college, when all these things are done, then, if I don't have any medical expenses, if I don't have any unforeseen expenses, then I will give. And, and the scripture says, farmers who wait for the perfect weather will never plant. Some of the reasons why church uh, 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 going Christians never give in the offering, never give or never live a generous life is because they're waiting for the perfect time. And here's the thing. If you wait on circumstances, you are never going to walk by faith. Looking at the circumstances will cause you to not walk by faith. And that's why it's not based on circumstances, but God says you need to determine in your heart. Let's look at that in the Amplified Version. Uh, same verse, uh, Ecclesiastes 11. Okay, he says, He who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. So in other words, how are we supposed to live? That's why every single time you see from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it was in their time of need, it was in the time of lack that people used to sow. Why? If you're a farmer and if you have very little seed left, the best decision that you can make is make sure you sow that seed and don't eat it up. Why? If you eat it up, that's one meal. If you sow it, it can be multiplied for your future. Amen? All right. Uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, 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 Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and starting from verse uh, 15. Philippians and, and uh, in the New Living Translation, please. All right. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse uh, uh, 19. It says, as you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financially, uh, who gave me financial help when I was, when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Think about this. 
Paul is writing and he's saying, you're the only ones who gave to me financially. You're the only ones who did this. And then he says, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. Continue. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. And I want to echo what Paul says this morning as well. I am not saying this so that I can receive something. I am saying this so that you can understand the word of God and so that you can uh, 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 practice this in your everyday life as well. At the moment, all, I have all I need and more. I am generously... Uh, supplied with the gifts you have sent me with Aphroditus. They are a sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Now think about this. What he's saying is, what you have given to me is a sweet smelling sacrifice and acceptable to who? But I thought he gave to Paul. The people gave to Paul and Paul says, what you have given is sweet. It is a sweet smelling aroma to whom? Not to me. He says, what you're giving me is making God happy. Your giving is making God happy. And he says, that's why he says, I'm not saying this so I can increase for my benefit. He's saying, I'm saying this so that it may be beneficial for your account. Amen. And it says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs for, uh, from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, Philippians 4.19, many of us know this scripture. My God will supply all, all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. But when you read it in context, what he's saying is, he's not saying that to everybody. He is writing it to the people in Philippi. And he's saying, hey, nobody has given to me, but you guys did. Nobody has done this, but you guys did. And because of that, he says, and my God. He's not saying, and our God will give. What he's saying is, you have given to me, and what you've given to me is a sweet-smelling aroma in the eyes of God, or in the nose of God, or in the sight of God. And he's saying, because you have given to me, and because it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto God, now guess what? Because you have given, now my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So what's happening? So again, we're seeing that the, the law of sowing and reaping is still a very important thing for us as New Testament believers. Now, this does not go under works. This is not you trying to buy a miracle from God. This is you understanding God is already generous to you, that God has already blessed you. Now that God has already blessed you, now that God has been generous to us, now out of that generosity, we love one another, we care for one another, and we live a generous life just like God does. Amen? Amen. Now, as we continue, again, go back to Galatians chapter 6, please. All right. Now, I, I really need to rush uh, for lack of time. Ancient chapter 6 and verse uh, 12. The, the second thing that, so the first thing that we picked up from this particular chapter is the fact about sowing and reaping. The second thing that I want us to uh, uh, look from uh, this chapter or take away from this chapter is about boasting in the cross of Christ. Boasting in the cross of Christ. Now, it starts off in verse, let's start, uh, uh, um, uh, let's start off with verse 13. And it says, and even those who advocate circumcision keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. Now, verse 14. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest to the world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has been crucified. Now, here's the question. Paul says that he boasts in the cross of Christ alone. The question in, in our lives is, you see, every one of us boasts about something in our life. The question is, what are we boasting about? Every one of us boasts about something. 
We can boast about our family heritage. We can boast about our intellectual strength. We can boast about our good looks. We can boast about the money that we have. We can boast about our children, boast about the car that you drive, boast about the house that you live in, boast about the education that you have, boast about the connections that you have. We boast about different things in our lives. And, and Paul says, I boast in nothing but the cross. Well, what does that mean, to boast in the cross? Well, you see, to boast in the cross means, well, l l let me say it this way. The cross is actually very offensive to people, right? The Bible talks about the offense of the cross. Why is the cross offensive? Even though it is a symbol of love for us, why is it offensive? You see, the cross is offensive because in the message of the cross, in the gospel, comes this message. And that message is, whether you are living a very good moral life, you are on the same level as a criminal when it comes to spiritual things in the eyes of God. Now that's offensive. Why? Because, because religion is good. People will say, and people will say, every one of us living a moral life of my life. Morally, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't, uh, you know, steal anything from people. I've been a good person all my life so far. And you're telling me that the way I get saved is the same way a criminal who murdered people gets saved? And the message of the cross is, yes. The message of the cross is offensive in that way because he, you, what, what, what the gospel is saying is, hey, I know you lived a good life. I know you didn't kill anyone. I know you didn't rape anybody. I know you didn't uh, uh, commit adultery. On the other side, there's a guy who, who murdered people, who did atrocious things in his life. And the gospel says, uh, I know what you did was very wrong and you didn't do those things. But right now, in order to get saved, both of you are in the same boat. Both of you are on the same level. And the only way for both of you to get saved is to receive what Christ has done for you on the cross. And that is offensive to people. And it's hard. And even though if you might be born in a Christian family, you might have been raised in a Christian home all your life. And if you never struggled with that, you've never really understood the meaning of the cross. If you've never like, oh my God, what? That means someone can be like, can have the heart of Mother Teresa. And another guy on the other side can be a cruel dictator killing people left, right, and center. And you're saying they're on the same level in the eyes of God in order for them to get saved. The message of the cross is, yes. And I don't care if you're born in a Christian family. That's a hard thing to take. And you need to wrestle with that. And you need to come to grips with the offense of the cross. And then if, if you go down to verse, verse um, 13, let's read from verse uh, 13 to, um, uh, or, or we read verse 13. Uh, let's read verse 15. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. In other words, what Paul is saying is, he's saying boasting in the cross makes you a new creation. Boasting in the cross makes you a new creation. Now, what is a boast? The boast, uh, you know, right now we can think to boast is to be prideful or, or arrogant about something. But the way boasting actually originated, it's a way in which, you know, it, it's the way in which an army would, uh, uh, um, you know, encourage one another, rile themselves up before going into battle. Right? Now, now the, the World Cup is going on, right? How do the, the teams walk onto the field? All right, I guess it's another match. Let's go. They don't do that. What happens? They get into a huddle, right? And they start boasting about each other. What do they say? They say, we've got what it takes, right? What it takes to do what? To win the game, right? So, so okay, let, let's try this out. Like, just repeat this after me. Say, we've got. We've got. Come on, that's pathetic. All right, let, let's try that one more time, all right? Let everyone say, we've got. We've got. What it takes. We've got, We've got what it takes. What it takes. We've, got We've got what it takes. What it takes. Well, you know, you're ready to play the game now. 
right? That's boasting. Now, I know none of, maybe Jones is the only guy who can kick the ball in the right direction. Uh, uh, and we'll be a pathetic team if we go on the field right now. But what's do, what, what that does is you're boasting in that point. So, so now to boast in nothing but the cross alone. In other words, it, the, the way when I was reading it and when I saw this, I said, now confessions made all this more sense to me. Confessing the word makes all the more sense. Why? What you're doing is you're boasting in the cross alone. So in any area of your life, in no matter what situation you're looking at, you say, I've got what it takes. Why? Because of the cross. I can do it. That's why when you say that, that, that's why this is a very subtle thing. You know, the, the modern or, or postmodern movement or the self-help movement will say, I'm beautiful. I can do this. I'm smart. I'm wise. And, but, but all of that is centered around them. Okay? The big difference here is, are you smart? Do you have the wisdom of God? Yes. But why? Only because of the cross. Not because you're so smart. Are you getting that? So all of our boasting, it can seem, and, and so I, I was recently having a conversation and, and, and they say, what are these things uh, uh, that you're giving out to people? And, and I told the person, I said, uh, these are confessions based on who you are in Christ and, and what God has done for you. And, and they said, oh, oh so positive aff affirmations and positive affirmations. I said, I, and I understood what they were saying. I understood what they meant by that. But this is way more than positive affirmation. Positive affirmations are just about psyching yourself up. Right? This is not just about psyching yourself up. When you boast in the cross, you're saying, this is what, and, and when we boast in the cross, what are we saying? We're looking at the price that was paid. That's what it means to boast in the cross. You're looking at Jesus and you're saying, that's the price that was paid for me. And that's the price that was paid for my wisdom. That's the price that was paid for my righteousness. That's the price that was paid for my sanctification. That's the price that was paid for my redemption. That's what it means to boast in the cross. And so, so Paul is saying, in my life, I boast in nothing except the cross of Christ. And that's what needs to be the testimony of our lives. And what he's saying is, the mark of a Christian, or one of the marks, the one of the most important marks of a Christian, is that we boast in the cross of Christ alone. We boast in the cross of Christ alone. Very quickly, let's, let's look at uh, uh, two scriptures and, and, and we'll be done. Um, uh, let's look at... Um, uh, um, I'll give you a negative example. Ex Exodus chapter uh, 15 and verse 9. Exodus 15, uh, verse 9. If you can uh, have that on the screen, guys. All right. See, it says, The enemy boasted, I will chase them and I will catch with them. I will plunder them and I will consume them. I will flash my sword. My powerful hand will destroy them. All right, that's a boast, like we talked about when the armies used to boast and get ready for battle. Now, how are we supposed to boast? Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and verse 24. Jeremiah 9. All right. And it says, this is what the Lord says. This is the way we're supposed to boast right here. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Remember what I said. We are, we are supposed to boast and all of us do boast. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, what are we boasting in? So he says, don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. So for the world, it's like, wait. That's all I've got. And if you're telling me I'm not supposed to boast in that, what am I supposed to boast in? All right, he goes on to say, or the powerful boast in their power. Or the rich boast in their riches. All right, continue. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone. 
that they are truly known by me and understand that I am the Lord. What do we boast in? God knows me. I'm a child of God. That's why when we sing the song, I am a child of God. I know who you say I am. What are we doing? We're boasting in him. We're worshiping him because of what he has done. We're not saying I'm a child of God because of my talents. We're saying I'm a child of God because he paid the price for me. And then he goes on to say, uh, uh, who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. How are we supposed to delight? That's the way we're supposed to delight. The way we are supposed to delight is not in the things of this world, not in the things that you were able to possess, not the things that you were able to be given by your parents or family or different things or the people around you. But the one thing that you and I get to boast in is to boast in the work of Christ on the cross. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, I boast in nothing except. Again, that's why the religious things, uh, 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 please understand, what is he saying? He's saying the Judaizers, they're asking you to be, or they're telling you to be circumcised. Why? So that they can boast. So they can boast. I was able to get him to do that. And so they, if we're not careful, that can creep into our lives. And we'll say, you know, I've read the Bible three times this year. I fasted 10 days in the last week. Right? You boast. I've given so much. Do you know how much I gave to the church? Do you know how much I gave to the project? Do you know how much I gave to that pastor? He says, that's not what we boast in. We boast in what Christ has done for us. And this morning, as we come to a close in this series of Galatians, at the end of it all, I want us to understand, for us to live the Christian life, I want us to become people that boast in nothing but the cross of Christ. And understand the gospel, understand what he's done for us, and what that means in our everyday lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, your love. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do. Father, this morning we boast in nothing but the cross. We thank you. We love you. We glorify your name. For you have been good to us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.